Well, thanks very much indeed for inviting me to talk at the, the CIF conference. Um, you might notice there's a slight discrepancy between uh, my introduction as technical director and what's on the screen there as program director. I was technical director when I was invited here, <laughs> and I, when they found out I was coming to the CIF, they made me program director. So I am available for next year's conference. Um, I thought what I'd do today is say a little bit about what, what Crossrail is and then share with you some of the things which we've learned um, over the last 10 years or so. I am from Crossrail Limited, so I'm on the client side. That's my perspective. I realize there are a lot of people from contracting and designers and so on here today. So off we go. That's Crossrail. Um, it connects Heathrow with the, the West End, the retail part of London, the city of London, and the new area of, or newish area of Canary Wharf. It's 118 kilometers from end to end, but it's, we really regard it as being in two parts. So the, the red part in the, onto the right-hand side, which is also captured in the box, is about 80% of the cost. So that is the, the brand new tunnels, underground tunnels, and the 10 new underground stations, which are co-located, generally speaking, with London Underground stations. Um, when, when it opens, it'll run initially at about 15 trains per hour, move up very quickly to 24 trains per hour, and then to about uh, one train every two minutes, which is similar to what you get on the Jubilee line at the moment. 200, extra, 200 million extra passenger journeys every year, and it increases the rail capacity of central London by about 10%. Um, the case for, for Crossrail was made over many years, and in fact I was sitting next to somebody earlier today who was saying that, that the Dublin Metro project had been in gestation for a long time. Well, so was ours. Um, it was first talked about an east-west London railway in the 1940s. So it's taken a long time. Canary Wharf, uh, a derelict area of um, eastern London, the eastern dockyards. And you can see over time how it has built up and, and the, the infrastructure, mostly uh, commercial and offices and retail rather than residential, has built up in step with the improved um, transport infrastructure. And Crossrail connecting Canary Wharf to the rest of London and to, and to Heathrow is really the final, for the time being, part in that jigsaw of, provide, of transport generating growth in a capital city. Um, our funding model, broadly speaking, uh, Crossrail is funded half by local government, by the Greater London Authority, the mayor's area, and half by central government. Within the, the local government funding model, there are a, a couple of new devices. One was a, a business rate supplement where 2p for every pound of rateable value for properties above a certain value um, was imposed to contribute towards the scheme. And there was also what was called the community infrastructure levy, which was an additional charge for all new development in London on the grounds that the, the developments that were going to benefit from the, from the service that Crossrail was going to deliver would also contribute uh, to the cost of it. On the central government side, it was mostly, mostly found from national public funding um, with a relatively modest amount coming from the City of London um, and from Heathrow Airport. So broadly speaking, wholly publicly funded, um, but uh, with a small contribution from elsewhere, not very much. And looking ahead to the future, we would certainly anticipate having um, a greater proportion of funding coming from the private sector in any new project. So our tunnelling uh, was completed about three years ago. We started in May 2012. Um, it took three years. We had eight tunnel boring machines, um, which, broadly speaking, went from west into the centre and from east into the centre. 
Um, Pat Lucy here from, from CISC was part of one of those tunneling um, consortiums. It's very nice to see him again here today. Um, depth of the tunnels up to about 42 meters, deeper in the center, slightly shallower um, at the edges, 42 kilometers overall, and a 6.2 meter diameter tunnel. And we manufactured 200,000 concrete segments to line the tunnel, and they were all fitted by the tunnel boring machines as they went through. This is just an example of um, a crossrail station, so within the context of the London Underground. So if you know the west end of Oxford Street, you come to Tottenham Court Road, that's the, that's the less fashionable end. Um, that building is called Centre Point, which is quite a landmark in London. Um, so that's the, in red, that's the existing central line. Um, and that is a new London Underground station at the eastern end of uh, Tottenham Court Road. That's the, in black, that's the northern line going through Tottenham Court Road. And that's the Crossrail Station. So as you can see, the Crossrail Stations are very significantly bigger uh, than the existing London Underground Stations. The, the, the platforms are 250 metres long with initially 200 metres usable uh, to fit the new rolling stock. In terms of um, railway systems, um, the railway systems will be complete in a couple of months time, in December of this year. We're using um, overhead line electrification rather than third rail. Um, and the, the railway systems connect new and legacy signaling systems on, with network rail on the east and the west and with a new train in new infrastructure in the center. And if that sounds very complicated, uh, it is. And uh, that's one of the lessons learned, which I'll talk about um, in a moment. The stations, the, the, the concept for the stations was that at platform level, the crossrail stations would be, if not uniform, very similar. So as people travel through crossrail, they, they will know they're on the crossrail line as they travel at, at platform level. And you can see there, sort of top, top left and top right, the GFRC, glass fiber reinforced concrete paneling, which we put over the sprayed concrete lining in all the passages, passageways, and on the platforms. And as you get nearer the surface at the bottom, Canary Wharf and Tottenham Court Road, the, the stations adopt the, the style of the part of London where, where they are. So on the left, Canary Wharf, which is the you know, new financial district um, of, of London, it's sort of very modern, very square, very box-like, whereas in Tottenham Court Road, um, that's meant to be darkly artistic. Not, not really my strong, strong suit, I must admit, but anyway, it is darkly artistic, I'm sure. And that applies throughout the whole of the, 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 the whole of the route, uniform at platform level, sort of blending in with the local area at, at ticket hall level. The new Elizabeth Line trains, we're buying 66 new trains being built by uh, Bombardier, a Canadian firm at their factory is in, in Derby in the Midlands. The, the train operator is MTR, Mass Transit Railway, from uh, Hong Kong. And that franchise started in 2017. And the, the new tr we've taken delivery of the first of the new trains, and they're actually running on the surface to the, to the west and east of London, as I'll explain on the next slide. Um, but, and we're testing them within the cent central section, but they're not yet operational in the center, but they are working east and west, which helps with the reliability growth of new rolling stock. In terms of the, the bringing the railway into service, it's being done in five stages, two of which have been, have been um, completed already. So stage one 
was to, I don't know if you can see that dot, was to start to run trains on the surface in the northeast from Shenfield through into Liverpool Street, high, what's called high level, i.e. not through the tunnels. And that just allows mileage accumulation and reliability to build up um, on the rolling stock. In, in stage two, we did the same thing, running trains out of Paddington to, to as far as Hayes and Harlington, the new trains from, from Paddington to Hayes and Harlington, and some older trains, but on a crossrail service, um, out to Heathrow Airport, again for the same reasons. The, the major opening event is the central section, which is the bit in green from, whoops, from Paddington through to Abbey Wood. And if you follow the papers closely, you'll have seen within the last three or four weeks, we've unfortunately had to announce that that part, which we call stage three, the opening between Paddington and Abbey Wood, we've had to put back until next autumn because the, the integration of the signaling and the train control systems will not be fully tested and we can't demonstrate they're completely safe in time to open in December, which was the original plan, and that has now been put back. So we're now busy replanning that um, for next year. And then stages four and five um, are, really, are really just connecting up. So it's connecting up this surface section because you can see rather confusingly, you've got Liverpool Street there and there. They're actually the same place. So that's on the surface. And in stage four, we'll just take the trains down there through the tunnels into Liverpool Street. And in stage five, we'll run all the way out um, to Reading, um, which importantly passes through Maidenhead, which is important because it's the Prime Minister's constituency. Um, Crossrail has introduced um, development opportunities sort of above and around our stations, and the urban realm and the oversight development and the stations themselves are, are all one package and all part of the same funding model. And as I'm sure people who've been to to Hong Kong in particular will know, oversight development can be a huge um, income generator and funder for major projects. Um, in London, it doesn't quite work like Hong Kong because there's a limit on the, on the height that buildings can, are, are allowed to be planned for. But nonetheless, um, the, the oversight developments are making a quite significant contribution to, to the cost of, of Crossrail. And they're also um, building in a lot of new uh, office space, uh, supporting the building of, of new homes along the, along the route, um, and a lot of commercial office space as well. So they're an important part of the overall Crossrail program. In terms of skills development, um, we built a purpose-built training facility at the start of Crossrail called TUCA, the Tunneling and Underground Construction Academy. Uh, I think it's still the only um, soft ground tunneling academy in Europe. It opened in 2011. And although many of the people who, who have go through training here will not get employment immediately on Crossrail, it's more of a longer term project, but those people will feed through into the industry and so for, for Crossrail 2 and High Speed 2, the people who've been through that academy will then be getting um, long-term jobs on those other projects. Um, we've also, I think, played a reasonably major part in encouraging apprenticeships within the construction industry. Um, within the UK, we went through quite a long period where uh, unless you were, were a graduate, um, you know, your education didn't really seem to count for very much. And I think one thing that Crossrail has done, albeit that we've, we've only brought in a thousand apprentices, I think what we have done is help to put the apprentice career path through technician into more senior engineering and project manager roles. We've managed to get that back on the map and, and that I think will be one of our enduring legacies. Um, business opportunities on Crossrail, 96% um, of the contracts were awarded to UK businesses. 
Um, Crossrail is sometimes accused of being a very London-centric uh, program, and we're at pains to point out that over 60% of our contracts were actually awarded to companies outside of London, and 60% of those went to SMEs, to small and medium-sized enterprises. And one of the ways in which we've done that um, was to make, the, make um, tenders as simple as possible and to give the SMEs sort of early sight of contracts to enable them time to bid before the bigger players came in. We've also had a, an art program. This is all privately funded. Um, so we, we've run competitions at each of our major central London stations, or seven out of the ten of them. And then we've, we've gone out and asked uh, funders to come and, and sponsor artworks on each of the stations. So we will have ten major artworks in seven of our stations. They range from digital screens to, to glass, either walls or at Paddington Station, the canopy roof um, is, is itself an artwork, physical objects and so on. And we've engaged nine artists and that art program will come to, come to an end at the end of this year. So that's a, that's a quick spin through um, what Crossrail is. And I thought now I'd just um, share some of the things which we've learned over the past 10 years. Um, needless to say, we didn't get everything right, uh, but we have learned a lot in the process. So in terms of the learning legacy, um, we have a website, which if you look up on Google, it's Crossrail Learning Legacy, and, and you can go into it. It's, it is very comprehensive, and people have gone to a lot of effort to to note down the lessons which they've learned. And it covers you know, design, project management, health and safety, HR, procurement, town planning, and so on and so forth. It is very comprehensive. I think, I think the Brits are quite good at, at, doing, at writing down lessons learned. Um, I think the, the problem is, as Field Marshal Rommel uh, once famously said, you know, the British have the best military doctrine in the world. Luckily for us, nobody reads it. And the same applies often for lessons learned. So it's there. If you want to use it, go ahead. If you don't, that's up to you. Um, the governance model, I showed you earlier a, a, a slide of um, how the funding works. Well, needless to say, the governance model follows the funding model. So broadly speaking, we have a sponsor board made up of Transport for London and the Department for Transport. They sit above the Crossrail program, but we have an independent board and an independent chairman for the Crossrail project. And the sponsor board are able to control what we do through a, a written agreement called the Project Development Agreement. And that, that writes down, well, it starts with a list of requirements. It, it talks about funding. It tells us what reporting we're, we're required to make to them. Um, it sets out some spending rules and the rules by which um, there's going to be oversight. And, and the, the Crossrail Board sits independently underneath that. That might sound a bit odd, but in fact, I think it works really well. It means that the people who are on the program rather than being, if you like, employees of the National Railway or the, or the Capital City Railway, they are fully focused on delivering the program and they don't have any other duties. It also means that we can recruit our staff independently. We don't have to draw staff from a particular area or from a, from a company. We can recruit staff from anywhere. And I think it gives our teams a sort of sense of team spirit and identity, which they would not perhaps otherwise have. Design. Gosh. This is, this is a whole day's discussion all, all in one go. Um, the way we did it was the, the employer designed the tunnels and the civil engineering. We did a reference design for the MEP and we set a, a set of requirements for the railway systems. 
And I think we've, we've learned an awful lot over, over the past 10 years or so. And the, the learning which I've taken from it is firstly, as an employer, I would do more design and not less. So at the beginning of a program, you've, you've got a choice of em, lots of employers design, not very much design and build, or go completely the other way around. And you'll have to make a decision on any new project about which way you're gonna go. For my money, I would go for employers design. Once you've appointed designers, um, I think you, you have to manage the designers in exactly the same way as you would anybody else. And I don't know how many designers are here, but, but contractors sort of tend to get a pretty hard time from clients. Maybe designers don't, and if they don't, that's a mistake. Uh, with a railway which is both linear and vertical, there's always the question of how are you gonna split up the design packages? Um, and my advice would be to, to look for the interfaces and to split up the design packages where you minimize the interfaces. I know that sounds obvious, but I think it's often not done. Then to standardize wherever possible, and we've heard lots about standardization, off-site manufacture, 3D printing, and so on and so forth, but really to standardize wherever you possibly can. Uh, we probably didn't do enough of that, and, and we're suffering the consequences now where you've got maybe three different types of building management system across the stations on Crossrail, and that's three times the amount of assurance, it's three times the amount of everything. It's difficult for everybody. It'd be much better if we just started and say, right, we're gonna do it like this, and we're gonna do it across the board. Um, we didn't do that mainly because we thought we would be able to sort of pass the risk down to the supply chain if we didn't do that. Complete rubbish. Um, you know, we should have standardized more, and I'd highly recommend it, including off-site. And then linking up designers and contractors. This is an industry-wide problem. Um, I think Brian Morriso talked about this in his talk earlier. You know, getting, if you, if you were building a car, you'd have the, the people who were building it and the designers, they'd all be together, they'd be doing it concurrently and that sort of thing. In the, in the cons construction industry, we don't do that, and by the time the contractor's on board, now, they might just inherit a design from somebody else. Well, we've got to find a way around that and stop doing it because it is, it is absolutely suboptimal. Um, systems integration. Um, at the moment, this is my biggest headache. Um, suffice it to say, I think if you're setting off on a new project, you've probably got three choices. The options are either you can make systems integration everybody's business, it's part of their job, um, it's written into contracts, it's written into the works information, and everybody has got a role to play. You can employ a, an external systems integrator and bring them in to do the job for you, or you can have a bit of both. Everybody's job, but, but actually have quite active supervision um, of the integration function. We started off with the first of those, you know, everybody's business. We are currently, for the last year, year of the program, we're moving towards the bit of both model and we're beefing up our systems integration team, albeit without taking accountability away from anybody who, is, who has an accountability for systems integration at the moment, which is pretty much everybody. On signaling, so that's one of our test trains coming out of Pudding Mill, Pudding Mill Lane portal, which is on the, on the northeast leg. Um, Signaling is massively complicated. Um, I would just say, if you have the opportunity to minimize the number of systems which you have to integrate, I would, I would take that as a very big win early on. Obviously, try to use in-service systems wherever you can. Um, I guess in the signaling world, with technology moving so quickly, there's no such thing as an in-service system because they're all developing but to the extent you can have a product which is in service on another railway somewhere, I would use that. Allocate plenty of time for testing, and when you've allocated plenty of time for testing, triple it, and re again, reduce the number of variables overall, so if you're introducing new infrastructure and new signaling systems, uh, you'd probably be very, very well advised not to introduce a new train at the same time, which we have. 
One or two men people have mentioned quality. Um, I think it is very important. Um, on Crossrail, we've had 20,000 NCRs over the 10 years of the project, 20,000 NCRs. And we regard that as a really good thing because what it means is that 20,000 things have gone wrong, people have put their hands up, and we've gone and fixed it. And in most cases, in fact, nearly every case, we have paid for it. I mean, literally, we've paid for it as a client. We're happy with that. There's another railway in the Far East right now, similar size to Crossrail, um, same period of time, had 200 NCRs, and they're going through a massive quality problem at the moment, which, I, as far as I know, they don't know how to solve. So quality vital with, with an NCR, active NCR system, where NCRs are quickly identified and put right. So I, I would advise get your quality management system in early, make it as short as you possibly can. You know, don't allow people to turn it into a library. The, the QMS is a thing that tells people what to do. Um, include competition amongst the supply chain all the way down. I've been astonished how successful competition in quality has been. We have completely transparent league tables. Pat will remember them. I'm sure SIS were at the top every time. Um, you know, really successful, and it does drive performance in a way I was, I was very surprised about. Um, good communication, and like everything, leadership from the top. On the sustainability, um, you can't be successful without a sustainable project. Um, just a, a couple of points on sustainability which have been made already today. Firstly, write your sustainability requirements into contracts if you're a client. I think we heard that uh, earlier today from Westminster City Council. Social return on investment. If you want something done, it has to be in the, in the contract. Um, our biggest headaches in the environmental area has been noise and, well, noise, really. Uh, we've also done a lot of work on air quality. And perhaps the final thing is on Generation Z. Um, Generation Z, um, I, think, I think it was said in the panel discussion um, a moment ago by Tara. You know, Generation Z, they, they know about technology. They also know about the environment. And you know, looking at people, some of whom are nearer my age than, than than uh, Generation Z, um, you may find yourself running to keep up with some of your employees. Um, so get with the pace, and, and you know, the, the younger generation correctly thinks sustainability is important, so you need to think it's important too, in my view. Um, innovation, I think I'll skip over innovation uh, because we've heard so much about it, it today. Digital, off-site, robotics are probably the areas that, that we have been most interested in. We've set up, we set up our own um, innovation uh, project called Innovate 18. It's now an industry-wide project called I3P. Um, you won't, as a, as a client on a major project, you won't reap the benefits of your own efforts in an innovation. They will be for the, for the next generation, but as a major government client, um, you know, you have a duty to, to be part of the national effort um, towards innovation. And the final thing I just want to say is, is on collaboration. And we've heard a lot about people um, during the course of today. I think the construction industry, certainly in the UK, um, is still quite adversarial. And collaborative relationships are ones where all parties can succeed. Um, in an industry where there are, there are small margins with high risk, as we heard, um, you know, the way to make money for everybody to succeed, I think, is through collaboration to reduce cost rather than push the target up. That's where the money is. Yet, notwithstanding that, we don't seem to have quite got it in the, in the industry. And I'm sure there's a solution out there where, whereby everybody can come out on top. Clients can get what they want with value for money, and, and contractors and designers can, can increase their margins. And the way to do that is absolutely not through adversarial relationships. And the culture of a business um, is all about leadership. And in my experience of 
nearly 10 years on Crossrail, every business behaves like their leaders. And that's a golden rule to which there are no exceptions. Thank you very much. Do you want to sit down? Sit down beside me there, Chris. Thank you. Um, in terms of big picture stuff, Chris, I mean, as we try to do the metro here, in terms of ways where it can go catastrophically wrong, what's the one or two things we should be trying to avoid? What are those pinch points that can really undermine the project from your own experience? Um, that's a, that's a good, I mean, from a, from a safety point of view, I mean, clearly the, the tunneling is, is the time at which the, you face the biggest risk of a catastrophic accident. Yeah. So I think there is, there is no shortcut to being absolutely 100% sure that your tunneling operation is going to be safe. So that's, that's probably the first thing. I think I would look very carefully at the beginning of a project about how you're going to package design, as I, as I said in my talk. And if perhaps those two things, safety and design, safety design to start with, I would get yeah, right. I just, very quickly, I just want to talk about funding. What's yep. the best funding model to make projects like this happen? Well, I think we've been very lucky because we received um, all our funding up front. So we were set a budget um, back in 2009. Uh, we had uh, a billion pounds taken out of that budget, um, I think two years later. But the budget has remained stable for the whole of the program. In many mega projects, the, the budget flows in in, in chunks over time, and that clearly is more, is more difficult. The, the other thing is that the, the client organization, the SPV, if you have one, needs to own two things. It needs to own the budget, and it needs to own the requirements. And I have seen projects where the, the project entity might have had the budget, but it didn't have a firm grip over requirements, and a third party, another part of government, was, was changing requirements, and that was okay. impossible to manage. Okay. Chris, thank you very much. If it seems that this whole project has operated with what we would call military precision, uh, <laughs> it's because it has been. Uh, in a previous life, um, Chris was, in fact, the chief engineer of the army, responsible for 10,000 military engineers in, all across the world. I, I found out this because I looked, and it said in, his, in, in some of the jobs he's worked on have been in... Iraq, Afghanistan, the Balkans. So uh, I think London is a nice sojourn for you now. So look, thank you very much for joining us here today. I really appreciate your time. And you're around over lunch if anyone wants to. to, to nab you.